Welcome to the London Business School webinar series, Beyond the Crisis, where we discuss topical issues through the whole pandemic period with London Business School experts and friends. Today is actually the very final uh, webinar in this series. We've had them every week, twice a week for most of the time since the 17th of March, in case any of you are keeping track, that's 26 webinars in total. Uh, we've got lots of other London Business School webinars coming up, um, which I will talk about at the end. Uh, today we're going to be talking about maintaining strong customer relationships through a crisis. And to discuss this kind of important topic, we have two colleagues. First of all, Professor Anya Lambrecht, who is a professor of marketing at London Business School. Welcome, Anya. Hello, hi Julian, and welcome everyone to our webinar series. Thank you very much. Also, uh, adjunct professor of marketing, Richard Heitner. Richard, welcome as well. Thank you very much, Julian. Delighted to be doing this with Anya and yourself. Perfect. So without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to, I think Anya is going to kick us off. Anya, let me hand over to you and you can tell us about some of your insights and some of your research in this area. So welcome again, everybody. I, Richard and I are going to speak about customer relationships and marketing in a crisis. Now let's take a step back to the pre-crisis world where we had many different ways of um, communicating with customers through video, uh, video advertising, digital display advertising, social media, outdoor advertising, TV advertising, and so on. But what happens along comes the virus and it has profound implications for business and advertising alike. And of course, for consumers, starting with the consumers, if you go out on the streets of London now, or more so even four weeks back, it was empty. That holds internationally. Consumers were not on the streets, shops were closed. Hmm. Now, of course, this has implication for business. Uh, where consumers went out shopping on a regular basis before, now people are lounging at home in their sweatpants, um, you know, perhaps browsing online, perhaps ordering delivery but it's certainly a very different shopping experience. Now this had had profound implications for sales and profitability. In many sectors, sales and profitability declined dramatically. And one question I would like to ask you here, and this is our first poll question. If you think about the economic impact of the crisis on your business, and then the measures you took for your marketing expenditures, what has been the impact of this pandemic on your marketing expenditures? Did it strongly reduce them or perhaps somewhat reduce marketing expenditures? Did you have no effect? You kept them pretty much constant or did you increase marketing expenditures somewhat or strongly? Okay, so we are waiting for our poll results here. Yes, so what we can see here is that about uh, 60, 60 to 70 percent of businesses here reduced their marketing expenditure strongly or somewhat. And we have, uh, we do have about 20 percent, roughly 20 percent, who kept that constant. Now, um, Richard and I also did a prior survey with a mix of B2B and B2C companies, and uh, we found very similar results here, where also uh, we found a large number of firms reducing their marketing expenditures. Now, this is, of course, most obvious when you go out on the streets. And you know me, we may all be very grateful for our healthcare services, the NHS in England or um, healthcare services across the world. But I have to say, if I see such a billboard, I find this rather worrying. Worrying because the implication is that no one else is advertising. That advertising space is free. And instead of um, having paid for advertising, uh, firms offering billboard advertising offer that for free or at a lower cost to thank our healthcare workers. This holds for the US, but similarly, if you look at the other countries, these here are examples from Ireland and, uh, and the US. Previously, we had the UK. Now, the big question, therefore, is in such a crisis, should you actually continue to communicate with your customers? And I do want to acknowledge here that, you know, there are instances and, and firms where it is simply impossible. 
we are so cash flow constrained that it's impossible to actually pay for advertising. It makes it very hard. Now, that doesn't mean that there are other firms and other ways to reach out for, to customers that are less um, financially straining, but uh, it can be, of course, a strong constraint. Now, if we look at the actual marketing spend, this year is a forecast for the whole of 2020. Um, advert, UK advertising expenditures. And you will see that in total, a 17% decrease is forecast. Uh, this is massive, of course. Um, we would have similar numbers for many other countries. Where does this come from? Well, you can see that even search and online display advertising have increased. So people are at home, they are browsing their websites, but still we observe less advertising. Similarly, people are at home. Still, we observe a decrease in TV advertising. And of course, outdoor advertising and newspaper advertising have been hit even more dramatically. Now, to think a little bit more about whether or not it's worthwhile advertising, let's go back to a really fundamental concept of marketing, the marketing funnel, which I'm sure many of you are aware of. The basic idea is that when you do marketing and especially advertising, this can be targeted at different levels with a goal to increase awareness, increase a consumer's interest in a product, drive a decision or ultimately make the action happen. And when we look at where decreases in marketing expenditures largely happened, that was mostly at the top of this funnel. It's also referred to as brand advertising. So pushing the awareness of inter and interest. However, at the bottom of the funnel, to some extent, we actually see decrease increases. Amazon had an increase of 40% in their advertising revenues. Well, obviously, consumers went to Amazon in order to purchase, and so suppliers tried to push their products at that point of purchase. Um, even Facebook and Google, while there was an overall drop in revenues, those that were direct response advertising, that had the goal of driving a consumer to an immediate purchase actually saw increases. And lastly, imagine what a consumer does who's lounging at home on their sofa. Well, you know, they might be using a lot of apps. So app installed advertising that has for purpose to get an immediate download also saw a, a very strong rise. Now the question though is, you know, as a firm, in an economic crisis, is it really the best idea to cut your brand advertising so significantly as we have observed this? You know, if you want to battle the crisis, what should you actually do? And to think about this more, I would like to go back to another crisis, 100 years back from 2020 to 1920. And so in the 1920 world economic crisis, we observed a very similar pattern in advertising. Many firms cut their uh, advertising expenditures. And again, you know, some had no choice. And one example that's very interesting is the market for cereal, packaged cereals. Uh, Kellogg and Post were competing in this market. And what we saw is that a Post actually very much reduced the advertising expenditure versus Kellogg's kept advertising constant, oh, and, uh, sorry, actually increased advertising, right? The Kellogg's increased advertising, post decreased advertising. And what we saw then in the long term at the end of the 1920s is that Kellogg's had gained a significant amount of market share from post, which helped them in the long term. Now, interestingly, this had been studied already in the late 1920s. Um, in a, a HBR article from that time, it was found that increased magazine advertising was related to an increase later in sales relative to those firms who did not advertise. Now, you know, as a researcher, we always have to acknowledge that those firms that stopped advertising were perhaps somewhat different than those who continued advertising. Perhaps they were not doing that well in general. However, if we again fast forward to 2020, to the current economic situation, we find a similar pattern. Whereas many firms cut advertising expenditures, P&G actually increased 
the advertising during the COVID-19 crisis. They felt this is not a time to go off air and lose consumer attention. Now, let's talk through a couple of reasons why you may want to emphasize brands in your crisis, in a crisis. First of all, it's really important to build long-term customer relationships. And the example of Kellogg's versus Post shows that that can be especially important when others do not try to grab consumer attention. Second, when for the consumer, every dollar matters, every pound or euro counts, it may be actually much harder to convince the consumer to buy your product. So if you have to work much harder to do so, perhaps you will have to actually spend more money and get more advertising impressions to convince the consumer um, to purchase. And lastly, you know, especially in the current situation, Think about consumers not going to shops anymore, not having the, um, the exposure to brand, the physical availability in a store, but instead purchasing online. Well, you know, 95% of consumer products that are purchased in online grocery stores come from the list of favorites. That is the products consumers bought before. If you want to get into that set, that consideration set by consumers, it is especially important to keep the brand alive in the consumer's mind. And so what you can see in general, it may be extremely important to continue talking about your brand and your brand value. Now, if you do so, what type of conversation should a firm have with their consumers or customers? Well, to answer this question, let me go back to a piece of research um, that I did. And as you can see, the context here is travel. So clearly that happened before the COVID-19 mm -hmm. crisis. And the question we asked was, if a consumer browsed the website and visited the website of a travel company, so specifically here, this was a firm selling packaged holidays. And then this firm, the consumer doesn't buy and the cons a firm would later like to advertise to this consumer again on the web through display and ad advertising. Should the firm show to the consumer a generic creative with a beach lounger evoking the idea of a holiday, reminding them of the general benefits of holiday along with a brand name, and here I've taken vacation company just as a substitute, or alternatively, should the firm show the specific hotel the consumer visited um, on their prior journey in the web, on that firm's website, alongside three other hotels that are similar? And so this here is my poll question. If you would make a prediction whether the generic creative or the specific creative is more effective in driving a consumer to purchase, which one do you think is a more effective? Should the travel firm use a generic creative type beach lounger evoking holidays? Or should the travel firm show a specific creative showing the specific products a consumer previously browsed? Uh, so this is very interesting. We, uh, we have here as a result, that 40% think the generic creative would be um, uh, more effective in getting a consumer to purchase. And 60% believe the specific creative with a specific product would be more uh, effective. And this is broadly what the industry thought. Um, so the general thinking in the market at this time was that it's better to show the specific products um, and a lot of investment had gone into creating these type of ads. Well, if you look at our results from the study we did with this firm, we actually find the opposite. The generic creative was far more effective in convincing consumers to purchase than the specific ad. Now, this was at first a puzzling result. Because as many of you, I would have thought that a consumer benefits from being reminded of the specific product. When we dug deeper into the data, 
we found that ha that has to do with the consumer's decision process, how the consumer goes about making their purchase decision. And we have evidence that when a consumer is early on the decision process, perhaps not yet entirely sure where they want to travel, um, are still trying to make up their mind of the best type of hotel, it is actually much better to remind them with a generic creative. And only, only when the consumer is very close to making a purchase decision, just about to purchase, then a specific ad is more effective. But on average, it turns out that giving a broader brand message of the values of the product or the brand can actually be better at converting a consumer. Now, there is, of course, a small caveat. We're looking here at travel um, and not at uh, maybe shoes or fashion. And, you know, if we have a, an item that might be more of an impulse purchase, these results could possibly be somewhat different. But I think they give us pause to think in the sense that overemphasizing individual product characteristics may not necessarily be useful. And let's go back now to the consumer lounging um, during the COVID-19 crisis on their sofa um, and browsing the web. And maybe the consumer needs a new pair of jogging bottoms or sweatpants. Would it be better to send the consumer this, these type of messages, reminding them of the individual products? Or perhaps even the consumer lounging at home likes to hear about the brand's values and uh, what the brand stands for and the associations and aspirations a brand has. And so in some, I think what we can see here is that even during difficult economic times, focusing overly on individual products and scaling back dramatically on advertising targeted towards awareness and to interest towards the top of the funnel may actually mean that a firm may lose out and lose out in the type of brand perceptions it would like to build up in the consumer's mind. Mm -hmm. Now, let me wrap up here. Three points that uh, I'd love you to take away on marketing in a crisis. First of all, continue your conversation with customers. If the firm is cash constrained, it might be about thinking about less expensive uh, ways of continuing the conversation. But nonetheless, continuing a conversation with customers is important and advertising might be a good means to do so. Second, you may need to work harder on convincing a customer to purchase in a crisis than at other times, simply because those customers are cash constrained. And lastly, be mindful of emphasizing the brand. Do not be tempted by the fact that market that consumers might be less likely to purchase on average to completely cut your advertising that promotes your brand and only channel everything towards end of the final advertising that emphasizes the immediate purchase. Anya has uh, advised us then to keep communicating with our customers and to work even harder during a crisis. And there are plenty of examples of brands and businesses that have done this well, and brands and businesses that you may judge to have done them not so well. I think these two pieces of communication on this slide demonstrate to me how some brands organizations have perhaps erred during this crisis. On the left-hand side, we have from the Ambassador Theatre Group, uh, a request, a a request for our help, which is the shows will go on and when they go back on after the crisis, we need you to come back to the theatre. Uh, please support us. That's the, that's the request. You might imagine then that there might be something in it for the customer who's paid to go to the theatre and had their shows cancelled. And here on the right hand side is the ATG communication that came through by email to say, uh, we're very sorry that we've had to cancel the show. We're working really hard to get your money back. And when we do get your money back, you will enjoy a full refund. The slight surprise, however, being that when you get your refund, a portion of that money has been taken back by ATG to cover its operational cost. So it's a kind of, please help us. 
Um, but it's all take on behalf of ATG and nothing reciprocal in the relationship uh, beyond that. And if you think about then the conversation you need to have in a relationship you wish to endure, you have to be counted on for your trust. And trust, as we know, is made up of a number of things, including your competence, your credibility, your reliability. Those of you uh, who are in the professional services environment will know of David Meister's equation that talks also of the thing that fundamentally is the biggest variable of trust, and that's your ability to park your own self-interest and to be orientated more by your customer's interest. That's what reciprocity is all about. And what I'd like to share with you is um, a provocation really about how you earn more reciprocity during a crisis, how you create this sense that you and the customer are in this together and that you are willing, even when the chips are down for you yourself as a business, you're willing to sacrifice something of yourself in order to drive uh, more reciprocity. And in a minute, I'm going to invite you to think about how much your own business and brand has shown a de degree of reciprocity towards your customers. And the two axes here uh, along the horizontal is um, whether the crisis has actually been good or not for your customers. Whisper it quietly, but certainly some of the clients I consult to have said that the market has been quite benign for them, that they've had quite a good crisis, and that's to be expected. Um, on the other side of that, of course, is, is uh, the context that faces most customers, which is they are on the back foot and they're in need of some kind of help from the brands that they interact with. On the uh, vertical axis, there is this self-orientation versus, if you like, selfishness. And I'm trying not to be judgmental here because I appreciate that many businesses have existential threats facing them and that survival is all. But just to be playful around this, I'd like you to consider uh, where your brand or business might sit in this particular map. And let me just illustrate this for you first. If you think of those we might describe playfully as sinners, those people who know their customers are in trouble, need some help, but they still put their own business interests first. You might have Ambassador Theatre Group there. You might have the airlines that have failed to refund you your money. If you're a small to medium business, you might have one of the big four banks who, despite the government backing loans that they could lend to their customers, were very slow off the mark in getting that money into the hands of their business customers. That's not helpful. It might also be my own landlord in Camden, where I reside, um, showing little flexibility about payment terms and alternative arrangements during the crisis, even as they're promoting on LinkedIn, how flexible they're prepared to be to prospect tenants. These are people who I think we might remember in the long term as having perhaps let us down. Top right, we've got those who've actually been more saintly. They've been our saviors that without even thinking of what they might get back from this in return, they've jumped in and they've helped us when we have needed their help, whether that's free coffee for NHS workers, uh, which Pret were very quick to do, the Four Seasons in New York turning over their, ho uh, their hotel real estate to frontline workers, to a whole host of great businesses who've shown generosity and benevolence in times of crisis without expecting anything back in return. Possibly one really good commercial example, Admiral Car Insurance, who in the UK gave back premium to their customers on the basis that there were no cars on the road, no accidents therefore likely to happen or could happen. So we don't deserve all the premiums that we're charging you, have some back. Bottom left, where the times are perhaps okay for customers, but the business still continues to put its own interests first. You might say that the, uh, these are businesses that are perhaps showing a degree of cynicism or short-sightedness, uh, we might say. In the professional services context, this might be serving a client whose business is going very well, but you deciding that you're going to make hay whilst the sun shines, you're going to sell whatever you can at whatever price you can, with no real thought to the long-term relationship. Top left, where again, things are looking okay for your customers, but you are still supporting them. You are still acting as a trusted advisor, a trusted partner, someone who is investing in a long-term relationship. And I think that's a very good place to be if you can. 
while still handling the profit imperative. You can't be saintly on an ongoing basis and still hope to sustain your profits. So, in good times or bad, here's the poll question. Where would you plot your own business? Let's see how many saints and sinners and cynics we might have uh, in our midst. So if Sada, we could have our poll question now, that would be great. Thank you. So are you a sinner putting your, ba uh, your own interests first and foremost, even when your customers are struggling, a cynic uh, when they're not struggling so much, but you're still driven by your own best interests, are you partnering and supporting in the long term, investing in a relationship, or are you simply the saint that we've all been waiting for? How might your customers best describe you? So let's see how many of each we have in our midst. Interestingly, 71% of you think you have behaved as real strategic partners to your customers. That also reflects, by the way, the pre-work survey we did, where a lot of you felt that coming out of this crisis, your relationships with customers kind of paradoxically would be strengthened, which suggests that you're exhibiting the kind of selfless behaviors uh, that really do build enduring relationships. So I've got now five provocations for you, five very brief provocations on how to drive your R rate up. And that's not the awful R rate that we're hearing about in the news every day. That's the R rate to do with reciprocity and how you can give this feeling of reciprocity more to your customers. The first example is what we hear in marketing all the time, you put your customer first. And there's many a purpose statement that says we put our customers first. It's not just about knowing your customers, it's not simply about knowing what they really care about, which is insight work in itself. But the crisis reveals it's knowing what they care about in a particular context and matching that with what it is you can provide that is uniquely of value to them in that context. I think my favorite example here might be Zappos in the US, who at the very beginning of the crisis, when people were kind of uh, like headless chickens, worrying about where they were gonna get their next uh, lot of eggs, where they could get their face masks, what advice they might need. Instead of their customer service people simply waiting to give best advice about shoe sizes and shoe range, which simply wasn't happening. They turned their entire customer service agency over to almost like a concierge service for customers, whatever they happened to need. They even had a medic from Mount Sinai Hospital asking about where they could get hold of these oximeters to measure pulses. They had people wondering about where they could get 10 kilogram weights uh, to more mundane things about where they could or how they could uh, make their own face masks. It's a really good example of a, a business saying, on our value curve, customer centricity and customer service is vital. Here's how we'll demonstrate it. The second example, of course, is knowing that it's all about your customers, is who's delivering that experience to your consumers or customers. It's your people. And we as customers do care deeply, even more now, how businesses treat their people. Are you exhibiting those signs or not? Are you equipping your people to be the best they can be in the context they're having to operate? My wife has switched retail grocery outlets to the store that she feels has best equipped its people to feel at ease when they're serving her in store. All grocery retailing outlets facing the same crisis, the same anxiety from their customers, but those businesses that have invested and equipped their people to be their most calm and reassuring have actually won new business through this crisis. That compares and contrasts to those businesses who were so quick to not just furlough their staff, but throw them on the streets uh, like Weatherspoons, in my book, A Sinner, uh, with the chief executive simply saying to his people, good luck, go find yourself another job somewhere else at Tesco. So how you deal with your people, a massive driver of, in the end, uh, a sense that you are in this together with your customers. Three more ideas for you. Um, it's very important, as Anya says, that you keep communicating, you keep having the right conversation. Even more than that, it's about showing your customers that you care and delivering to them. So Lloyd's here claiming and spending a lot of money telling us that they're by our side. Not only did they fail to get their small business customers the money they needed urgently, but they've just been fined 64 million pounds by the UK regulator for not looking after their customers who were screaming for help during their mortgage arrears. So by your side, probably not more as a customer, it might feel like you've got to watch your back. 
And uh, there are, however, really good examples of businesses who've shown us, not just told us, whether that's Amazon continuing to deliver ahead of the expectation it sets when you order something for them. Nespresso, one of my favorite brands doing the same. We're sorry about the delays you're gonna uh, have to encounter, but we're gonna get this to you as quickly as possible. And then they beat the date that they're going to do that. Another example might be PepsiCo, not just putting money where its mouth is with a huge donation with its very rich resources to a COVID relief fund, but very specifically knowing that restaurants, restaurant workers, a domain they have a right to play in and need to play in, launching four very specific programs to help those who work in restaurants. And if you do, of course, communicate, make sure that you create your own rules for moderation. We know that Twitter now is a little bit more assertively moderating on tweets. I encourage businesses to moderate your own communication, to screen out that which you think your customers might find irritating or insincere. It didn't land very comfortably with me when a luxury goods brand uh, told me that it was worried sick about my family during this crisis. It was there for me. It was there to support me. And might I be interested in buying a piece of expensive jewelry to show my mother how much I cared. I felt that to be lacking somewhat. Improvisation is uh, the, the, the fourth idea. And we've had brilliant examples, even as local as your own high street, of businesses that faced with constraints, faced with this crisis, have been able with great agility, with great spontaneity, uh, to do something different. So cafes that have turned themselves into fishmongers, green grocers, or even kind of music centers like uh, my local Wetfish Cafe, or in a B2B context, this particular service, the accounting app uh, that is used during the crisis, uh, its own customer base to research what's most on their mind. It won't surprise you that's cash flow. They launch an additional feature on their app to help their customers with their cash flow. And then finally, to bring us right back to where we started, how much are you prepared to sacrifice? And to the CFOs on this webinar thinking, this all feels like um, it's a kind of nirvana. Uh, does uh, this professor not realize that we're in this business to make profit? It's important to say, yes, uh, profit is, of course, an imperative. But you need to remember that customers in the long term are what you're counting on as your greatest contributor to intangible assets and therefore your enterprise value. And that sacrifice comes in many forms, not just expensive monetary forms, but in your time, your effort and everything else. So I urge you as we come out of this crisis to remember one thing, and that's that customers are like elephants. We never forget a good experience, a bad one, a great piece of brand communication, or a quite insincere one. And with that, I think we're opening ourselves open to questions. Perfect. Thank you, Richard. That was terrific. And we'll get Anya back as well. So as always, lots of questions. Um, and some are directed to one or other of you, some are directed to both, both of you. So I think this first one really does relate to both of you. It's, it's about pricing, um, and, and it's a fairly obvious question, which is around, I mean, I guess you can say, first of all, does price elasticity go up or down in a crisis? I mean, that's just a question I'd like to have your thoughts on. And I guess very more specifically, you know, what should we be doing um, to, to either cut our prices or deliberately hold the line on our prices. And obviously the answer is going to de depend on the segment, but Anya, why don't you have a go at that first, then I'll go to Richard. Yeah, Julian, I think this is a really interesting question. And you know, you probably won't be surprised if I start this out by it depends, right? So how do price elasticities change in a crisis, especially if I think about, you know, the, the pandemic and the lockdown, well, you know, um, for some good goods and products, people were willing to pay a lot more. Have you tried searching on Amazon for pavement chalk? Uh, amazingly expensive. Why would anybody pay for pavement chalk, a little box to keep the children outside, 10, 15, 20 pounds? Well, obviously they do, right? Because people actually value these products more during a crisis. On the other hand, you know, many fashion products were discounted heavily. Well, why? Nobody's going out anymore, right? You don't need this last beautiful dress and the beautiful shoes to match your dress because, frankly, it's wonderful to keep your family happy, but perhaps it's not worthwhile a couple of hundred or thousands of pounds. Now, 
so having made this clear, you know, there is a part of the pro some products where there was high pricing, overpricing, even price coding, right? Remember at the start of the pandemic, prices for hand sanitizers went through the roof to the extent that Amazon um, announced they would be policing them, but then it wasn't quite clear how strongly Amazon was policing them. And I think here we have to ask the question, what is ethical? Why should there be price ceilings for some type of products? Now let's turn to the other side of the question, which I think was what was originally intended. Um, should you discount your products during a crisis? Well, let's assume your product is not the type of product where it's an excessive demand during the crisis. I think the first question you have to ask yourself is, um, how much do consumers still value this product, mm. right? Um, and is there a group of consumer that, consumers that perhaps continues to value your product at the, at the same price or at a relatively high price? Additionally, well, how long do you think the crisis is going to last? Let's assume you're a fashion retailer. Well, if you can hold out until the summer, you may be hopeful that then ultimately consumer willingness to pay may still be there. It's just that don't want these good goods when they're sitting at home. So I think it's not a straightforward question. Even if temporarily demand drops, demand might be rising and willingness not to pay might be high in the long term. Now, you know, I'll hand over to Richard in a second, but let me give you a third point here. We first looked at those products where willingness to pay actually rose. Then we have products where the willingness to pay is actually quite steady, but there's a temporary drop in demand. And then you may have the third bucket where willingness to pay actually drops because people are just not willing to spend as much anymore. And uh, thanks, I, Richard. Do you want to add to that? I mean, Anya, by all means, come back again. Oh, yeah, sorry, my video um, left me, oh, but it's Richard, quite all right, Richard. I'm, otherwise, I'm happy to go back to this. Okay, go on. With a, with a B2B example, actually. And I think um, it's really important to remember that we are in a reciprocal relationship. So, to the businesses out there who've suddenly unleashed their procurement departments on their poor supporters and partners, or if they call them this, suppliers. Um, be careful, is, is all I would say. You might be in a position of greater power in the short term, but those whose talents you might need in the long term may not take kindly to being beaten up on price simply because there is an opportunity for you to do so. To those who are offering your services to brands and businesses in the B2B environment, I would suggest that exactly as uh, Anya is saying, if you believe that you are offering something of real value, then hold your nerve if you can afford to. Because in a relationship, uh, we have the need to respect each other and people won't respect you if you lose your nerve unnecessarily and discount your usual services and, and leave yourself exposed. So I think you have to take price very, very seriously. I, Again, like Anya suggested, if there's no one size fits all, but I would err on the side of backing yourself to win through as opposed to simply discounting straight away uh, to keep yourself in the business. And that means presumably trying to find ways of adding additional value while retaining your prices the same rather than discounting, right? Absolutely, Julian. And I think some, some have done that really, really well, whether it's being generous with their content, whether it's being free with their ideas, uh, for example, offering learning and development opportunities to uh, your clients. All of these things are ways to keep reframing your value to these uh, clients over the long haul. Yes. And uh, if I may jump in there mm -hmm. and, and follow up on this, and at the same time, I think this addresses another question that came up in the chat window, um, which was about, you know, maybe it may just be hard financially to invest into advertising, right? I think there are many ways where you can promote your products that are not incredibly costly. Um, and that at the same time doesn't involve a price promotion, a price reduction. Um, the one example that I love is the way that arts organizations engage with consumers during the crisis. Um, uh, the Royal Opera House in London made, con made content free available for everyone. Now that had, did not have additional cost for the Royal Opera House. It also importantly did not involve a price promotion of their regular product. Mm. And, and uh, you know, if you, Universal made Andrew Lloyd Webber musicals free for short time periods. So I think thinking creatively of how to engage with a customer 
uh, can be very valuable. And perhaps there are points in here where we can learn from the crisis going forward and how to better um, handle customer relationships. I mean, it is certainly true that in our world, um, you know, webinars such as this, of course, have proliferated. Every business school, every consultancy runs a webinar series. And that's because the actual costs of creating these things are actually relatively low and you can indeed sell them, so sell them, promote them to thousands of people, but it does have a potentially interesting impact uh, in the future, which I'm not going to touch on now. Anya, I'm going to now ask you a very specific question. Um, your whole thesis really was that, that essentially, if you look at what people have been spending money, they've been shifting from awareness down towards action. But your argument is that that's, that's wrong. That is in fact sort of perhaps short-sighted and that we should be almost reinvesting in awareness and brand and the emotional aspects of, of, creating, uh, of creating a connection with our customers. What, why are companies getting it wrong? I mean, is it almost as simple as the traditional kind of short-term thinking drives out long-term thinking? What's, what's going yeah, on? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's really a classic, you know, a way that firms tend to behave in these settings is not specific at all to the crisis. We can see that when, um, you know, there is some, some cash flow constraint, right? Uh, and firms try to make sure they increase sales and use all funds available to push the purchase through the door, right? To kind of get the customer to buy. Now that works in the short term because these consumers, at least some of them will probably be buying, but you're losing out in the long term and even the medium term by not communicating what the brand stands for anymore. Um, and you may be losing out in two ways in terms of um, consumers' willingness to pay dropping because they don't see the broader brand values anymore. Um, and also the, the mere sheer drop in awareness. So how, I mean, I'm not a marketer, but I know a little bit about the world of marketing. C customer lifetime value is a, is a big concept in the world of marketing. You have metrics which are deliberately designed to help you figure out that, you know, if you invest in a, in a relationship in the short term, it pays off over the long term. Do those sort of metrics help us to, overcome this short-term thinking? Yeah, so as you say, the idea of customer lifetime value is, you know, very bluntly speaking, I don't want to invest more into my customer than the customer is giving me back in the long term, yeah. or than, you know, what my expected ROI would be. Yeah. But I think, you know, in a very simple way, you can see I invest today, um, uh, X into making the customer buy, the customer purchase immediately, and I end up with a net positive balance, hopefully today. Mm. Um, and I'm still, now don't forget, I'm still capitalizing all these brand investments I've done in the past, right? So I'm kind of running down my brand value over time, eating up all my brand investments, but I'm not investing further into the future. Yeah. Now, yeah. If I think about the customer lifetime value in the long term, if I want a customer to be willing to pay high amounts and in the long term, I need to invest into this brand, right? Now, practically, it may sometimes be more difficult to link brand investments to specific customers, uh, but nonetheless, it doesn't it take away the importance of actually keeping up this value from the consumer's point of view to actually then in the long term capitalize on that. However, in a cash constraint situation, custom companies and uh, maybe accountants more than marketers trying to have a short-term perspective. Yeah. And if I only reduce my perspective in terms of measuring the probability of marketing spend to one day, one month, one year horizon, then it might not pay out. But hopefully most companies will be taking a more long-term perspective. Perfect. Richard, do you want to talk to customer lifetime value, perhaps even in the, in the particularly in the professional services world, which you know best? Or? Just to add to that, the evidence and the data and the, the, the kind of marketing scientists would say that um, in any event, you have to keep yourself in front of consumers, one, because they're fickle and they don't buy brands as loyally as you would like them to, although there are things you can do about that. Two, you've got to keep an eye on recruiting the next generation of your consumers. And what's so interesting about Anya's example with the Royal Opera House is it may feel like just shipping your content out for free is a very generous thing to do. One of the surprises to the Royal Opera House is the whole cadre of new younger users coming in to interact with them and start a new kind of relationship with them. So not only are you investing in the long term for your existing customers, you may surprise yourself uh, with wholly new customers. And the, exactly the same is true in a B2B environment. You have to stay salient with your client base. 
Um, but if you start simply doing short-term transactions, then you're in effect reframing your relationship to be a very transactional one anyway. Got it. Questions to Richard now on the two by two matrix, which people clearly like. Always good to think about the world in such ways. Um, one question specifically is, what if my customer is the middleman? In other words, obviously I, I'm selling to somebody who's selling to somebody else. Should we be actually thinking about this in terms of our end consumer or should we be thinking about it in terms of our direct customer? Well, in a way, I think you should be thinking about it um, for both and indeed from your own employee base, because in a, in a B2B environment, you're nothing without your relationship. And these partnerships really, really matter. I mean, you, you, some, some of our listeners may have read uh, um, the, 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 the kind of the big business that owns vast amounts of kind of uh, different kinds of business, but including Primark, for example. Uh, Primark um, immediately uh, cut off um, its uh, relationships with many of its suppliers at the very beginning of the crisis. It stopped paying them. And again, it may well have needed to do that because, of course, they have very little digital presence, Primark, if any. They've, they've bet their fortune for that brand on uh, real bricks and mortar. Uh, so they probably did have, within that portfolio, very, very clear cash constraints. But the impact of doing that to their supplier, uh, to their supply chain, I think will, will resonate and ring out loud for quite some time. So for me, um, this is a state of mind. Are you the kind of person running a kind of business with your people and your intermediaries and partners and your end consumers? Are you more saintly than, than, uh, than not? Are you prepared to be more self-orientated uh, or, or, or are, you, are you more willing to suborn your interests Indeed. in the interests of your customers? And I think that's, that's a bet that you're making huh. that in this day and age being purposeful and doing the right thing will in the end yield better results. Got it. And there's a question from someone called Ian who says, is London Business School a saint, sinner or a partner? And that's directed as much to me as to either of you. And, and when I answered your question, Richard, I tick the, the partner box because obviously um, there's a certain amount of you want to believe that you're being a partner. But the way I kind of motivate or justify that answer is we are desperately trying to figure out ways we can create additional value to our customers. Certainly our existing students who've had, of course, a, a pretty rubbish experience through these last couple of months. We're trying to find ways of giving them more stuff and we're trying to find ways of building additional relationships with customers by, for example, putting on these webinars. Do either of you have any, any thoughts on how London Business School's handling itself through this crisis? This is our last webinar, so I think we can afford to be a little bit uh, more internally focused than usual. So I, I, I'm, I'm gonna jump in first because A, I'm an alumnus, so I'm, you know, I, I, I was on the Sloan program in 2003. I have a love affair with London Business School. Uh, like many love affairs, you know, you are, you're willing to kind of confront your, uh, your, your relationship warts and all. I think what the London Business School uh, response to the crisis has shown is that marketing is a leadership imperative and it's led from the very, very top. So if I take the inside out uh, part of, part of my, my thesis, I'm suggesting that the London Business School response has started from the inside. Mm -hmm. And I think the communication has been really very, very good to mm -hmm. staff and faculty. I think we've been kept in the picture. We've known what sacrifices we're being expected to make. And I think there's been a very kind of decisive response to the crisis. So I would suggest in this particular crisis, I'm giving the school uh, and have talked to my client base about the school's response as being pretty, pretty good. But and you may have a more academically critical. What, any, any quick thoughts on this? I've got time for about two more questions after this one. Okay, no, I think Richard uh, gave like a fabulous summary, especially as, as he has this view, both from the inside and from the outside, which is more than I can claim for myself. Uh, you know, my, my sense is indeed, as, as Richard and Julian said, we have worked very hard internally and externally to support student experiences, to provide extra value to students and in uh, other programs as well, wherever possible. And I do see this webinar series that, that Julian and, and others put up here and invested a lot of time here as one you know, important element of uh, going beyond the call of duty, uh, reaching out and contextualizing what we do, both in terms of teaching and research and really trying to, to use our knowledge and our insights um, uh, to help you know, students, 
clients, partners to in their own business are driving this forward and coming out of this uh, pandemic in a good way and maybe in a better way than, than before, even at some times. That's certainly what we're trying to do. Look, I've got time for one, actually only one more question. It's a, it's a, it's a neat question uh, and it's a difficult question, um, which is how does a, a sort of socially distanced world um, change the way in which marketing and selling and all the activities that you guys work on ch change? In other words, when you can't, for example, actually, you know, touch your customer. I mean, I touch them in, there are certain types of, sorry, services where you've got to physically, um, you know, be quite close to your customers. Any thoughts on how the world of, of marketing, particularly, I guess, in, in retail is going to change in a world where for the foreseeable future, we actually only have two people coming into a store at a time where we've got to be one or two meters distance. Julie, um, you say this is one question. This is an entire webinar that you're proposing. Indeed, that's true. <laughs> Let's try to give a quick answer, right? And there are so many points that could be made. One is, I think it's, it's been clear to, to all of us that the pandemic has accelerated, will continue to accelerate the shift to online retail. Right. If you want to give a consumer to come into your store, if you just stay with retail for a second, you will more than before give the consumer a good reason to do so. Right. They may have to wait, um, at least in the short term, outside of the stores. Very simply, they've gotten used to buying online. Mm -hmm. You know, even people who haven't purchased online before, they are so much used to that being part of their shopping experience. Um, back to retail, you know, Primark had queues in front of their stores, but they don't have, can't have any changing rooms open. Right. Right? So that changes the uh, experience as well. So I think it's important to rethink precisely what is the value that we are offering in store. How can we complement this? And you know, um, I teach an entire class on, on distribution channels. And as many of you know, 10, 15 years ago, we spoke about multi-channels and multi-channel management. Now it's about omni-channel management. And the whole idea is how can we integrate different channels? I think this crisis has shown this is more important than ever. Thanks, Richard. Quick last thoughts on this. I think the, the importance of making really intimate, emotional connections with your customers in that socially distant world is what will prevail. And those that are already exhibiting their ability to really understand what customers care about, whether they're physically interacting or more likely not, is how do you keep a relationship alive in your, in your own life at a distance? You demonstrate moments where you can uh, show empathy, that you care, and that you find new ways to make emotional connections. Got it. So thank you so much. Um, before we close, London Business School has been pulling together all of these webinars and then adding some additional material that you won't have seen and creating a little bit of a kind of a storyline that pulls it all together. And we've turned it into a product. We're calling it Building Organizational Resilience. It's an online product. Uh, and obviously we're trying to do this as a commercial thing, but we've deliberately set the price extremely low just to try to get people, organizations interested in making use of it. So if you're interested, um, I'm actually uh, taking a risk here. I'm going to suggest contact me directly. My email is at the bottom there, jberkinshaw at london.edu. And I'd be delighted to put you in touch with someone to tell you a little bit more about that product, because it's very much something that I and a couple of colleagues have been working on. So, so that's a little promotion of something that we've created on the back of all of these webinars. I am going to suggest that we close there. Thank you once again to Anya. Thank you to Richard for a fascinating conversation about building and maintaining customer relationships. And thank you, the audience, for listening. So I'm going to uh, close now. Thank you for t attending this entire series. It's been a lot of fun for me and I hope it has for you as well. So with that, I will say goodbye. Thanks. <laughs>